Hello friends, welcome to Dungeons and Dragonfly, where I adapt various characters for use in d and I'm Dragonfly9078, and today I'm building the Lord of Calamity, Velvet Crow. First a bit of background, Velvet was just an ordinary girl living in a village with her brother Lafayette, sister Celica, and brother-in-law Arthur. Then came the Scarlet Knights, when the moon turned red and monsters appeared. Celica died during the first, and during the second, Arthur sacrificed Lafayette in front of Velvet. Enraged, she attacked Arthur, resulting in her left arm being cut off and replaced by a demonic one. After spending three years in prison, she escaped and swore revenge on Arthur. So what do we want from this build? Well, obviously, we need her giant demon claw, as well as the super mode that comes with it, draining her health to become more powerful and changing the effects of her attacks in different situations. In addition to the super mode, the claw is how Velvet eats now, absorbing people, demons, and even magic through it, and using their power for herself. She can also fight with both mystic and martial arts when she doesn't want to show off the giant claw, so we'll need some of those as well. Looking over at ability scores, I'll be using the standard point array. If you want to roll for stats, that's fine, just make sure your strength and charisma are high enough to multi-class. Velvet's a very physical character, so our highest stats will be focused on that, with a 15 in strength to swing around a claw as big as the rest of her, a 14 in dexterity for quick reactions in case someone falls off a bridge, and a 13 in Constitution, because we probably need a strong stomach if we're going to be eating demons. Intelligence and Wisdom are on the lower end, since the game is all about emotion versus reason, and Velvet tends to fall more towards the emotion side, while Arthur is all about reason. And we'll finish up with a 12 in Charisma, since Velvet isn't above using her Lord of Calamity title to get what she wants. Now, Velvet used to be human, but getting that claw made her into a Therian, or a Demon Eater. So we're going to make her a Scourge Asimar. All Asimar get plus 2 Charisma, and Scourge Asimar in particular get plus 1 to Constitution. We have 60 feet of Dark Vision, and to help out our human friends, we can cast the Light Cantrip. Velvet hunts both Demons and Exorcists, so Celestial Resistance will give us resistance to both Necrotic and Radiant damage. And once per day, we can touch a creature as an action to heal them an amount of HP equal to our level. Scourge Asimar also get Radiant Consumption at 3rd level for our Consuming Claw. We can transform with our action once per day, shedding bright light within 10 feet and dim light for another 10. At the end of each of our turns, every creature within 10 feet of us, including us, takes radiant damage equal to half of our level. Also, once per turn, we can deal additional radiant damage equal to our level to a creature that we hurt with an attack or spell. The transformation lasts for a minute, though we can end it early in the bonus action. Velvet sat in prison for three years, dwelling on how the last thing she saw before being thrown in there was her little brother being sacrificed by her brother-in-law, who is an exorcist for the church, so Haunted One seems appropriate for our background, giving us proficiency in arcana and religion. We'll also grab proficiency with the chef's utensils to make some delicious quiche. Now, Velvet isn't the most emotionally stable of people, and she doesn't wear armor, so we'll start off as a barbarian, giving us proficiency in athletics and perception. The barbarian version of unarmored defense makes our AC 10 plus our dexterity and constitution modifiers, and unlike the monk version, it can be used with a shield, Velvet doesn't wear armor, of course, but she does have an armored bracer that her sword retracts into, which I'm fine calling a shield. First level barbarians also get to enter a rage as a bonus action, giving us resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, as well as advantage on strength checks and saves, and extra damage to our strength-based melee attacks. Velvet does have her moments of losing control, of course, but this is really more fitting for just having her claw active, regardless of her mental state, since it's almost certainly stronger than her normal human arm. We can also attack with it recklessly, giving ourselves advantage on our strength-based melee attacks at the cost of giving everyone else advantage on attacks against us. And after three years of fighting for our lives, we've gained a danger sense, giving us advantage on dexterity saves against effects we can see, like spells and traps. Barbarians can pick another skill at third level with primal knowledge, I would go with intimidation, and we can pick a primal path. Since we're flavoring our rage as having our claw active, we need the claw to have variable effects for different enemies. The Path of Wild Magic doesn't tailor the effects to specific enemies, but it does give our claw a variety of different effects with Wild Surge. When we enter our rage, we roll a d8 to pick an effect from the Wild Surge table. On a 1, Shadowy Tentacles force a constitution save on all creatures within 30 feet of us, dealing 1d12 necrotic damage on a fail and giving us 1d12 temporary HP. On a 2, we teleport up to 30 feet and can do so again every turn with our bonus action. A 3 summons a spirit next to an enemy that then explodes dealing 1d6 force damage to every creature within 5 feet of it if they fail a dexterity save. Then again, we can summon another each turn as a bonus action. 
On a 4, one of our weapons becomes magical, changing its damage type to force damage, and letting us use it as a thrown weapon, teleporting back to our hand at the end of each turn. If we roll a 5, we deal 1d6 force damage to any creature who hits us with an attack. A 6 gives us an aura with a 10-foot radius that increases our AC, as well as the AC of any of our allies within the aura by 1. A 7 turns the ground within 15 feet of us into difficult terrain, but only for our enemies. And an 8 lets us shoot a beam of light at a creature within 30 feet with our bonus action each turn, blinding them and dealing 1d6 radiant damage if they fail a constitution save. We also learn to sense lingering magic to better help us find the ones we're hunting. A number of times per day equal to our proficiency bonus, we can use our action to sense any spells or magic items within 60 feet of us, and learn the school of magic in question too. We'll finish off our barbarian levels by bumping our strength and constitution with our first ability score improvement, and jump over to fighter for a fighting style. We actually have a couple of good options here. Unarmed fighting makes the damage of our unarmed strikes a d6, or a d8 if we have both hands free. And we can deal a d4 each turn to a creature we have grappled, so we can kick along with our sword. Alternatively, dueling adds 2 to the damage of a weapon we're wielding one-handed, as long as we aren't using any others. So that could apply to our sword, our claw, or possibly even our hidden boot knife. My personal preference is unarmed fighting since I do want to get Velvet's kicking in the build in some fashion, but dueling is not a bad alternative. We can also stay in the fight longer by healing ourselves for 1d10 plus our fighter level as a bonus action once per rest with second wind, and action surge lets us take a second action on our turn once per rest. At third level we become an eldritch knight, letting us magically bond with two weapons. While we're bonded with them we can summon one as a bonus action, and we can't be disarmed of either of them. We don't have the weapon that will be our claw quite yet, but once we do, it'll be pretty solidly attached to our body. We also get spells from the wizard list, meaning they use our intelligence modifier, which is not great, so we'll try to mostly pick ones that don't rely on it. Shocking Grasp unfortunately does, dealing up to 4d8 lightning damage to a creature that we hit with a melee spell attack, as well as preventing them from taking reactions for a turn. But we do get advantage on the attack if they're wearing metal armor, so that should even out the low attack modifier a little bit. Green Flame Blade, on the other hand, uses our strength to make a normal melee attack with a weapon, then deals up to 3d8 fire damage to the attack target and a creature next to it if we hit. We get three first level spells at third level, two of which have to be either abjurations or evocations. Shield adds five to our AC as a reaction, and Absorb Elements eats an elemental attack with our claw as a reaction, giving us resistance to either fire, cold, lightning, acid, or thunder damage, then adding a d6 of that type of damage to our next melee attack. We do get one spell from any school, so we'll take Featherfall. We learned our lesson about falling from Lafisa. Fourth level Eldritch Knights get another abjuration or evocation, Earth Tremor slams the ground, forcing a dexterity save on any creatures within 10 feet of us, dealing 1d6 bludgeoning damage and knocking them prone on a fail, as well as making the ground difficult terrain if it's loose dirt or stone. And with our ability score improvement, we'll bump our strength to 18 for more damage with our claw, which we don't actually have yet still, so let's get that as a Warlock of the Great Old One in a few levels. First, we get Awakened Mind, so we can speak telepathically to any creature within 30 feet of us and we get spells that use our charisma instead of our intelligence. Thunderclap slams every creature within 5 feet of us, dealing up to 4d6 thunder damage if they fail a constitution save, and create bonfire sets a fire in a 5 foot cube that deals up to 4d8 fire damage to a creature that passes through it and fails a dexterity save. Cause Fear plays on a creature's fear of death, possibly by demonstrating that we can and will consume people with our monster claw, frightening them for up to a minute if they fail a wisdom save. And I would assume that demons count as fiends, so protection from evil and good will give them disadvantage on attacks against us, and prevent us from being possessed, charmed, or frightened by them. The same is true for Aberrations, Elementals, Celestials, Fey, and Undead, though those tend not to be our main concern. We'll also pick up Eldritch Sight at second level to find the demons wherever they go by letting us cast Detect Magic at will without expending a spell slot, kind of an upgrade on the whole lingering magic thing. At third level we can finally get our claw with the Pact of the Blade, letting us summon a melee weapon as an action. We can summon any kind of weapon normally, but in this case we're going to go with the Claw of Akamar. Claw of Akamar lets us summon a black lead flail with a head shaped like grasping tentacles. Unlike normal flails, this one has reach, so we can attack creatures up to 10 feet away. And if we land a hit with it, we can expend a spell slot to deal an additional 2d8 necrotic damage for each level of the expended slot. And whether we burn a slot or not, Hitting with it also reduces the target's speed to zero for a turn so they can't run away. 
And since we get second level spells at third level, we can use Hold Person to grab them with the claw and let our friends wail on them. For our fourth level ability score improvement, we're going to take the Flail Mastery feat, because honestly, how often do we see a character use a flail? I mean, Velvet technically doesn't either, but she does in this build, so call it Claw Mastery if you really want. We get plus one to attack rolls with our Claw slash Flail, and our opportunity attacks with it knock the target prone if they fail a strength save. We can also use our bonus action to reach over an enemy's shield, giving us an extra plus two on attack rolls against creatures using shields for the turn. We'll pick up Booming Blade too, adding up to 3d8 thunder damage to a melee attack, and an additional 4d8 if the creature willingly moves at least 5 feet before our next turn. Bear in mind, if we use our claw to do this, we can still burn a spell slot for more damage, and reduce the creature's speed to zero, though obviously that'll make it a bit difficult for them to move to get the extra Booming Blade damage. The attack target does have to be within 5 feet of us for both Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade from earlier though, even though the claw has reach, it's part of the spell. For our 5th level invocation, Thirsting Blade lets us attack twice with our packed weapon using the attack action. Now could we have just taken an extra level of either Barbarian or Fighter to get extra attack, so we could attack twice with all of our weapons instead? Well sure, but Thirsting Blade actually fits the flavor for once, so I wanted to take it. Our third level spells are also in flavor for a claw that eats everything, with Counterspell to absorb spells as they're cast, and Dispel Magic to absorb ones that have already been cast, as well as Vampiric Touch to drain the life from a creature, dealing 3d6 necrotic damage and healing us for half that amount. We can maintain the spell for up to a minute and use our action to make another draining attack, though since these are spell attacks, they don't have the normal effects of our claw. Sixth level Great Old One Warlocks can even drain luck from their enemies with Entropic Ward. Once per rest, we can use our reaction to give an attack against us disadvantage. Then, if it misses, we get advantage on our next attack against that creature before the end of the next turn. At seventh level, we'll grab Improved Packed Weapon, giving our claw plus one to its attack and damage rolls, and letting us use it as a focus for our spells, like Banishment, which sucks up a creature who fails a charisma save storing them in a harmless demi-plane if they're native to the plane they were banished from, or sending them to their home plane if not. They reappear in the space they left from when the spell ends, but if they were sent to their home plane, they stay there if we manage to concentrate for the entire duration. Protection from energy is like absorb elements in that it gives us resistance to our choice of acid, fire, cold, lightning, or thunder damage, but it lasts for an hour and doesn't let us return the energy with an attack. We'll pick up Gourmand at 8th level, since Velvet is an impressively good cook considering the only thing she can taste is blood. Fun fact though, uh, you can actually substitute blood for eggs when cooking. And what's Velvet's specialty? Quiche, which is largely made of eggs. I just thought that was interesting. Gourmand rounds off our constitution to 16, doubles our proficiency bonus when we use Chef's Utensils, and lets us use our action to tell if food or drink is poisoned. We can also cook a meal during a long rest if we have the tools and ingredients. The meal serves up to six people, and anyone who eats it recovers two additional hit dice after the rest, as well as getting an advantage on constitution saves against disease for a full day. Now, ninth level has a little bit of a theme of improving on things we got earlier. Our ninth level invocation is Superior Packed Weapon, which is like an upgraded version of Improved Packed Weapon, giving our claw plus two to its attack and damage rolls. Now, this doesn't stack with the plus one from Improved Packed Weapon, so if you want to drop that and pick another invocation, you can certainly do that. But Superior Packed Weapon doesn't let us cast spells through our claw, so I'm going to keep Improved Packed Weapon as well. Our 5th level spells follow the same pattern, with Hold Monster working just like Hold Person, but without the humanoid restriction, paralyzing the target if they fail a wisdom save, and Enervation is an upgraded Vampiric Touch. A target within 60 feet of us makes a dexterity save, taking 2d8 necrotic damage and ending the spell on a success. If they fail, they take 4d8 instead, and are linked to us until the spell ends. We can then use our action every turn to deal an additional 4d8 necrotic damage. Whether they pass the save or fail, we gain HP equal to half of any damage the spell deals. The spell lasts for up to a minute with our concentration, but it ends early if we use our action to do anything other than deal the damage to the creature, if the creature is ever more than 60 feet from us, or if they ever have total cover from us. 10th level Great Old One Warlocks get another resistance and another cantrip. Thought Shield gives us resistance to psychic damage and prevents our thoughts from being read. Also, if we do take psychic damage, the creature that dealt it to us takes the same amount. And our last cantrip is Frostbite, dealing up to 4d6 cold damage to a creature who fails a constitution save, as well as giving them disadvantage on their next weapon attack before the end of their next turn. 
11th level warlocks get a Mystic Arcana, a 6th level spell that they can cast once per day. Velvet's Claw absorbs the memories of the people it eats, and there's actually a spell for that in D&D. So our Mystic Arcanum is Soul Cage. As a reaction, when a humanoid dies within 60 feet of us, we can capture their soul for up to 8 hours. During that time, we can use it in a couple different ways. We can ask it a question, which it has to answer truthfully. We can use our bonus action to give ourselves advantage on the next attack, ability check, or saving throw that we make before our next turn. We can use our action to create an invisible sensor in a place the soul saw in life, letting us see and hear what's happening there for up to 10 minutes with our concentration. Or we can just use our bonus action to drain energy from the soul and heal 2d8 HP. We can use as many or as few options as we want, but the soul is released after 8 hours or after we've used it in any way a total of 6 times. Our capstone is the 12th level of Warlock for one last ability score improvement and one last invocation. The ability score improvement is up to you, really. Uh, my choice is increasing dexterity, but if you want to cap off strength or bump constitution, charisma, or even intelligence to make our Eldritch Knight spells a little bit better, that's just fine. For our invocation, Life Drinker seems perfectly in flavor for the Claw, and adds our charisma modifier to the damage of the Claw's attacks. Now that the build is complete, the question becomes, how good is it? Well, our damage output is enormous. With our Rage and our Radiant Consumption active, one attack with our Claw deals 1d8 plus 30 damage, and we can burn a 5th level spell slot for an additional 10d8 necrotic damage on top of that. Though if we save that for when we crit, that's an extra 20d8 damage from one 5th level spell slot. And we have Reckless attacks, so we're always attacking with advantage. We're also adept at locking enemies down, with spells like Booming Blade, Hold Person, and Hold Monster, and also d just due to the properties of our Claw. Every hit reduces the target's speed to zero until the end of our next turn. And thanks to Flail Master, if we hit them with an opportunity attack, they have to save or be knocked prone. Since that opportunity attack reduces their speed to zero, that means that they literally cannot stand up if we knock them prone with our claw. And if they try to attack us from the ground to stop us from locking them there, they're in for a bad time. Even ignoring the disadvantage they get from attacking while prone, we're ridiculously hard to kill. We have a very respectable 170 HP, 6 resistances while we're raging, and absorb elements in protection from energy to give us more, though we'd have to drop our rage for that as well as for, oh yes, we have a lot of healing with vampiric touch and enervation. For downsides, our wisdom and intelligence are not doing us any favors, so we could be taken out of the fight before it really even starts. I'm also not a huge fan of Wild Magic Barbarian to be honest. It's a cool idea for a subclass, and it fits the flavor of the claw doing different things against different enemies decently enough, but the effects are mostly underpowered, even if you do go past 4 levels in it, the effects literally never scale, they don't change the entire time, and the unpredictability can be a little bit rough to deal with. And of course, you knew it was coming, we can't cast spells while we're raging. I don't mind as much for this build as I do for most of them, since we can just funnel our spell slots into ridiculous amounts of damage with our claw but it would be nice to be able to cast Soul Cage at least. So it turns out that Velvet's style of fighting, giving herself extra damage at the cost of her own health, isn't really a thing in 5e. Radiant Consumption is about the only thing I found, though if you know of any that I missed, I'd love to hear about them. I know there's like a semi-homebrew Matt Mercer Blood Hunter class that does that sort of thing, so if your DM is okay with it and you don't like Velvet being so absurdly tanky, maybe try that. Whatever the case, Velvet is definitely the toughest dub in the Menagerie. Cool, cool. Velvet! Do it now! You're damn right, Exit! Hey, Imperian! The Lord of Calamity is here! Wake the hell up! I hope you enjoyed the build. If you have any feedback or suggestions for characters you'd like to see me build, please leave them in the comments below. Leave a like or subscribe if you want to see more, and if you want to support what I'm doing here, you can check the description for the link to my Patreon for access to the Discord channel and early access to future builds. Thank you for watching, friends. I will see y'all later.